right? If you are new to Revelation, we, uh, we love to study books of the Bible, the way that God laid it out, just going verse by verse, trying to understand what God wants us to know. And we're in a really exciting book, the Gospel of Mark. You know, there's four Gospels, Matthew, t- say I'm with you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? So we're in the second Gospel. The Gospels are different men's accounts of the life of Jesus, They're not contradictory. They just see things from a different perspective. And it's really cool when you study them and then compare what the different viewpoints. It would be like if you, if there was a car accident out here on this intersection and four witnesses stopped to give their testimony to the police. And one person says, well, the red car ran the stop sign and hit the blue car. And another person would say, yeah, the, the, the Chevy hit the Ford. And the other one would say, yeah, that the, the man driving this car hit the woman driving that car. And you see where I'm going, right? Is that contradictory information? No, that's just each adding a different perspective. And that's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do. And Mark, it, it's interesting because all the gospel writers interviewed lots of people to get their testimony from, of eyewitness account. And the primary witness giving testimony to Mark was Peter. And some people even call this Peter's gospel because so much of it was from his point of view, which is great because Peter was right there uh, beside Jesus, and he's in this story. So we're going to study the remarkable life of Christ. Um, Rob Moore is going to be our scripture reader this morning. So Rob, come on up here. And Rob does a great job leading our Tuesday night life group that meets here. And right now they've been studying end times, talking about the second coming of Christ, and it's been really a good study. So Rob, read our scripture for us this morning. And it'll be on that screen right there. There you go. Mark 9, verse 1. And he said to them, Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took him, took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, is it good that we are here? Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what he had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come. And they did to him whatever they pleased, as it was written of him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. All right. Appreciate that. So um, how many of you know what a hyperlink is? Raise your hand if you know what a hyperlink is. Okay. So you could be reading a page about something on the Internet. And if you, and I'll give you a word, like maybe I'll come across that George Washington was the first president. And George Washington will be blue and underlined, which means if you want to know more about George Washington, just click here, and it'll take you to a whole other page about George Washington. And what's interesting about the hyperlinks, you know, it's a whole lot of information condensed down to usually one word, like Apple, Google, Microsoft, or whatever, or George Washington, but it's a whole lot of information condensed down to one word that kind of gives you a clue where else it's going. Well, in this passage of Scripture, there are a ton of hyperlinks. And those hyperlinks take you to the Old Testament. Old Testament stories, Old Testament people, Old Testament types and symbols, all kinds of stuff packed in this story. And this story that, we just, that Rob just read for us is what's often known as the transfiguration. The transfiguration. Many people don't talk about it as much as some of the other events of Jesus. His birth is called the incarnation, Right? We talk about his baptism. We talk about the beginning of his ministry. We talk about his crucifixion, resurrection, his eminent return. Um, But many people don't talk about the transfiguration, but it is very important because it answers the big question of who Jesus is. See, Mark is, this is the theme of the Gospel of Mark. 
is who is this man? Who is this man? And Jesus is dropping subtle hints along the way as to who he is, but he's not coming really right out direct and saying so, but he makes a big, bold statement with, this, with the transfiguration about who Jesus is. So this morning, we're going to con- answer that question more than ever before. And, and so the Gospel of Mark is 16 chapters long. We've just finished eight. So here we are at the mountaintop. Because that's the way Mark writes it. He has this theme here, and he progresses up the mountain. And at the top of the mountain is the transfiguration. And then he works his way back down. And what's interesting is the the beginning of the Mark looks a lot like the end of Mark. And each one of the parallel steps, because we know know that as chiastic structure for those who've been around for a while. But today, it's going to just come right out and and in a bold way, answer that question, who is Jesus? So the the transfiguration... Easy for you to say, right? It it will show us three things. Number one, it'll show us who Jesus is, what he has done, and how we can connect to him. Those are three big questions, right? That's what many people in the world are searching for. Well, who is God? Is there a God? If so, who is Jesus? And what has he done? Why should I connect with him? We're going to answer those three questions this morning from Mark chapter 9. And so Jesus said to them, talking to his disciples, he said, truly, now pay attention, whenever you read in the Bible, truly, it'd be like in today's thing, we'd be like, hey, seriously, seriously, listen, you know, we we might be joking around about other things, but hey, seriously, I need you to do this. And so we're trying to get their attention. And when Jesus says truly, he's saying focus on this because this is important. He says, he says, I say to you, the disciples, there are some, not all, right? That's super important, that word some. There are some standing here who will not taste death. In other words, you're not going to die until you see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now, Jesus's primary message all throughout the gospels is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. He often says the kingdom of heaven. Some people like to make a distinction between the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. I don't really see that as a clear cut distinction. I think they're the same thing. But people, good people can disagree on that. But he, he's been teaching on the kingdom of God. And he even says that the kingdom of God is here and the kingdom of God is within you. But then he also talks about a kingdom that is to come. So he talks about it in two senses, right? And he, he talks about the, the kingdom of God is like little children. He talks about what it is, present tense, but then he talks about what it will be. So it's like the now and the not yet. But he says one qualifier you're going to see the kingdom of God I've been talking about, but I want, you're going to see it with power this time. It's going to be different than I've been talking about before. And so some of you guys, not all of you, the disciples, are going to see this. Some of you won't see it until you're dead, but some of you will see it before you die. Um, skeptics claim that this is a failed prophecy. There's one really hateful atheist uh, on YouTube that says, See, Jesus said that the kingdom of God will come before you people die. And it hasn't come. And Christians say that the kingdom is coming later. And now all those disciples are dead. How could this be the truth? It's because he's not interpreting the scripture, right? I'm going to answer that question for you and show you how these skeptics are wrong. So the question is, when Jesus says the kingdom of God will come with power, when is that talking about? Okay. And I probably should have talked to you before to see what you thought. I didn't get a chance to talk to Pastor Stan. It was interesting. This past Tuesday night, we were talking about when I filled in for Rob, we were talking about end times, and I was just thrilled to see how much Pastor Stan and I agree on some things that we hadn't even previously talked about. We'll see if this is one of them. Maybe we agree. I don't know. Um, some people think that the kingdom came at the cross, that Jesus was crowned king, literally crowned, like a thorn of crowns, lifted up and exalted. Usually kings are exalted on a throne. Jesus' throne was a cross, with a, not a gold crown, but a crown of thorns, and that that's when the kingdom of God came in power. That, that, that's, a, that's a good theory. Um, another theory is that the kingdom of God came at the resurrection, that when Jesus, with resurrection power, came, and that's when the kingdom was introduced in, in a more fuller sense. Some people hold to the idea that the kingdom of God came with power at Pentecost. That's a really good one. Fifty days after the resurrection, the Holy Spirit ascended, and, and they, were, they spoke in tongues, and all kinds of miraculous things happened. And that would be a really strong case for the kingdom of God coming with power, right? Um, some people think that the kingdom of God came in 70 AD, that Jesus returned spiritually. Um, these people are called preterists, not predators, preterists, okay? And there's some good Christians who actually believe this. I definitely do not. Um, I don't think the second coming happened, you know, because Jesus talked about all kinds of bad things happening, and not one stone be left upon another. And this was partially fulfilled in 70 AD when the Romans sacked Jerusalem and fulfilled in, 
in many of the disciples' lifetime, what Jesus said would happen. He told them, hey, you need to head for the hills. They're gonna, there's going to be all kinds of bad things that will happen here in Jerusalem, and it, all of it happened in 70 AD. But I don't think that that's when the kingdom of God came in power of what Jesus is talking about here in Mark chapter 9. The last theory here uh, of the most commonly born ones is that the kingdom of God came in power at the transfiguration, and this is the one that I hold to. And let me, let me show you why, what Jesus is saying here. Now, let me just tell you, you're saying, Gary, you've lost me already. <laughs> this is really technical. Okay, and yes, some of this is technical, but let me just tell you, hang on to the end here, and you will see the beauty of this passage. So, in, in Matthew, Luke, and Mark, Jesus, John, John doesn't talk about the transfiguration, but the other three writers talk about the transfiguration. And all three of them, you, usually they kind of have a different spin on things. Again, not contradiction, but different. These three passages, almost word for word the same, and they all three tie Jesus' statement about the kingdom of coming with power and the transfiguration together. That's important. So that's why I believe that's the case, because it's, it, he, him tying them together, he's saying, hey, it's going to happen, and you're going to see this, and it ended up happening just days later. Second Peter backs this up, because Peter was there, right? Remember, at the transfiguration, Rob just read that Jesus took three disciples with him. Who are they? Peter, James, and John, known as the inner circle. Whenever Jesus had something really important to pray about, he'd grab those three and tell the other nine losers to stay behind. No, just kidding. And then he'd just pull them aside and pray. And we, we all have inner circles, right? Okay? You have, your, you have a lot of friends. You got closer friends. And you got your best friends. And the same was true with Jesus. By the way, who was Jesus' very best friend? John, yeah, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. A lot of people interpret that meaning that he was the very one closest to it. And Jesus, in his humanity, nothing wrong with having a best friend. We all need one. We need several friends. But Peter was in that inner circle. Peter was the sum. Remember, he said, some of you will see the kingdom of God in power. The rest of you, you won't see it until after you die. Okay? So the sum would be the three, the way I'm interpreting this. And Peter was there to see the transfiguration. And, and now just remember what Rob read. Jesus glowed, his clothing and everything about him glowed like, some translations say like no launderer could get things white, <laughs> and in this one translation said like nobody could bleach it, and we don't even know if bleach was used at this time, it's just a way of, to help us understand that getting this, this, his clothes were radiant, he was glowing. Now, just put yourself in Peter's shoes. Imagine that you're there, and Jesus appears with him, Moses and Elijah, You've heard about these two heroes of the faith since you were a little kid. The, this was like the George Washington and the Abraham Lincoln that you've heard about your whole life. I guess kids, hopefully they're still learning about that. Maybe not. I don't know. They're probably too busy learning about other politically incorrect things. But anyway, uh, these two heroes were there with Jesus in person. Like, wow, these guys, these guys are back from the dead. And look at Jesus. He's glowing. Like, wow, this is amazing. You would think that'd be like the spiritual highlight of your life, right? And, and, and for good reason. But... Listen to what Peter says about this event. He was there, and he writes about this. He said, well, we didn't follow cleverly devised myths. We're not studying mythology, Greek mythology. We're not studying le legends and fables. We were there. We eyewitnessed this. He said, when we may know to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses of what? His majesty. Now, when you meet a king, what do people often say? Your majesty, Right? And Jesus talk about his kingdom, of which he's the king, coming in power. So Peter chooses this word majesty on purpose because he's talking about a king and his kingdom. And he goes on to say this, For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, not just Jesus in glory, but what kind of glory? Majestic. And what does majestic speak about? A king and his kingdom. So this all fits together. And what did the voice say? Mark chapter 9 said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then, of course, in Mark's passage, he says, he adds, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. So only three times was, was a voice from, from the heavenly father spoken where people could hear in Jesus' lifetime, his baptism here at the transfiguration. And then another time, and he said, this is my beloved son. And so he's tying this together. So he's not talking about the baptism. He's not talking about the other time. He's talking about the transfiguration. And listen to what he says. Um, actually, we'll come back to that for just a second. 
So hold that thought about what Peter said as an eyewitness. So then he goes on to say, we're back to our passage here, Mark chapter 9. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, there's the inner circle, and led them up a high mountain. That's important because you read, when you're reading through your Old Testament, okay, many of you are reading through the Bible this year. Hopefully you're on track. If you're not, you'll, you'll catch up. But every time you read about a high mountain, something important is taking place. When Abraham was told to sacrifice his son Isaac, where did they have to go? I mean, not Isaac, it, um, Jacob, I mean, Abraham and Isaac. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm getting mixed up this morning. I have enough coffee, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, where did they have to go? Up to a high mountain, right? When Moses went to get the Ten Commandments, where did he go? Up upon a high mountain. So when you read high mountain in the Bible, you know that that's important. So here Jesus is doing something important. Peter, James, John, this is important. This isn't just another little prayer group. We're not having discipleship time. Something important is about to happen here. We're going up to high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured. The word there, you'll recognize it. Uh, in Greek, it's metamorphe. What word do we get from that? Metamorphosis. And in seventh grade, you learned about what? Butterflies. You know, the, 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 from a caterpillar to a butterfly, that's a metamorphosis. That's a radical change. So Jesus radically changes before their eyes. And of course, the radical change is the glowing, the glowing of not only the clothes, but everything about him. And he was transfigured before them. So this, is, this isn't something myth or legend they heard about. They were eyewitness and they saw this. Matthew talks about the same thing. He says, after how many days? Six days. Now, what do you know about six days in the Bible? What else happens in six days? Creation. And Jesus' kingdom coming is the new creation of which he's the king. Something I just learned a couple months ago, a little part related to the creation. So what day was Adam created? The sixth day, Adam and Eve, right? And then what happened on the seventh day? He rested. So guess what? Adam's first, Adam and Eve's first full day of being alive was a day of rest with God. You know, he probably was like, okay, God, what do you want me to do? Because you told me to be in charge of the garden, take care of it. You know, he told us to be fruitful and multiply, and we'll take care of that too. Uh, and now, what do you want us to do? And God's like, let's just chill. Your first 24 hours are just going to be chill with me. And that shows you what God's intention was, just to rest with God and to spend eternity with him. But that six days is important. So after six days, Jesus took him up, and he, he uses the exact same language. He's transfigured. And then you look at what Luke says. And it's, it's a little different. And skeptics will look at this and they'll pounce on it. Luke says, now about eight days after these things, he took with him Peter, James, and John and describes the transfiguration. And they say, see, aha, there's contradictions in the Bible. Matthew and Mark say, after how many days? And then Luke is saying what? Eight days. But notice what every word counts, right? About eight days. And Luke uses the word about 13 times in his gospel. It's interesting, for a medical doctor, he's not very precise on this. He doesn't need to be precise on some of these issues. Like, when Jesus fed the 5,000, he says, about 5,000. He didn't mean it's literally 5,000. Okay, 4,998, 4,999, 4,000, 5,000, boom, that's it. It wasn't being precise. He said about. And so, therefore, about here. But it's even better than that. It's not, we're not going to cut Luke a lot of slack just because he said about. If, if you read the way he says it, if you include the day that Jesus told them, and then after six days, there's a transfiguration, you got a day on each end, how many days is that? Eight. And the about could be just because we're rounding up on the hours, it wasn't literally 20, eight 24 hour days. So he's, the about is not about the days, it could be about the hours, because if you count the way he says it here, after these sayings, count that day, six days, and then on the day of the transfiguration, then you do have eight days. So again, it's, it's, not, it's not a contradiction. In fact, when people read the Bible, if they're looking for contradictions, they'll find them. If they dig this deep. If they dig this deep, there's all kinds of reasonable explanations for all of them. And let me just also say this. Everything in the Bible that appears to be a contradiction, and notice, say appear, appears to be a contradiction, none of them have to do with any important doctrine whatsoever. None of them. And I believe that there are no contradictions in the Bible. And I've been studying the Bible since I was very young. That's what my degree is in. I've been studying this forever. And, and the thing, though, is when you know somebody and you love somebody 
and then something comes along that they say or do that doesn't make sense, what should you give them? The benefit of the doubt. And see, the reason that God doesn't get the benefit of the doubt and the Bible doesn't get the benefit of the doubt is because people don't love God. Because if I can explain away the Bible and if I can explain away God, then guess what I get to do? Whatever I want. But if this Bible is true and if this God is real, then I owe everything to him. And a lot of people don't like that, okay? So they look for contradictions and they see them where there, where there are none. And you see that happen all the time. Politicians take each other out of context. The news media does a horrible job of always taking people out of context. It's just people can twist words and make it look like what they want to because they have an agenda. And, and we can't just point fingers at lost people and the world. Sometimes we do it too. We will flip open our Bible and guess where we go? To our favorite parts, the parts that make me feel good. And the parts that make me feel uncomfortable, we kind of just breeze through those, okay? We can't edit God's word. We have to read it word for word. Actually, let me go back here. Um, so as clothes became radiant, okay, it's sparkling, whatever word you want to use. In fact, it's almost like Marcus using so many words because he can't describe what Peter saw here. And it was, it, was, it was radiant. It was glowing. This is the kind of thing that we see in the Old Testament, right? Remember when Moses received the commandments on the mountain? What happened? A cloud came down, and there was lightning and light flashing and all kinds of things. By the way, fascinating thing. I, I, was, uh, I was following the news a little bit yesterday, and there was a, uh, a story about a Ukrainian soldier that they were kind of hunkered down on, near a roadside near Kiev, and they could see with the binoculars, here, be, here came a whole bunch of armored vehicles and tanks from the Russians coming around the corner. And they're like, oh my gosh, and they're counting, they're like, and the line is like not ending. And they're like, we are going to be seriously outnumbered here in about a couple hours. And they started raiding and trying to get help, but they got limited supplies and limited manpower. And one of the, one of the soldiers got on his cell phone and called his dad and says, dad, we are about to be outnumbered. This may be our last conversation. He said, I need you to pray. I need you to pray that God would intervene. And his dad went to the Bible study that he was about to go to, and he asked the whole people, all the, people, the Christians in that Bible study to pray right then and there for these soldiers that were fighting. And it was getting dark at the time when they're in the evening Bible study, and the, the tanks are drawing closer, and these guys are holding their position. And in, when it got dark and the sun went down, they said what looked like a UFO or like a cloud came down over the tanks, and all kinds of lightning started flashing and sparks and everything like that. And they couldn't even describe what they saw. They, the the word, best word they had for it was like a glowing UFO. I'm not saying it's a UFO, okay. But something that was glowing. And they said it killed the electronics of the tanks. And they froze there. And the Russian soldiers got out and walked away from their vehicles. I think things like that's happening. I really want to believe that. But this is what... The Old Testament talked about things, that the cloud coming down. There were several times. Remember, when Israel was wandering in the wilderness, and he, what did they follow during the day? A cloud by day, and that turned into a fire by night. So this is supernatural guidance right here. And it was intensely white. And, and again, like you would bleach your socks, and they would look incredibly clean, much, much cleaner and whiter than that. And so there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were doing what? They're talking with Jesus. So they're not, it's not like the pictures where they're standing there going, <laughs> okay, they're not doing that. They're having a conversation. And these three guys are talking. And of course, Jesus knows them because Jesus created them. Jesus appeared to them in the Old Testament. So Jesus is having a conversation with these two heroes of the faith. Luke 9 adds some details. that behold, two men were talking with him. And he tells us what they're talking about. Moses and Elijah appeared in glory. So they're also looking glorious. And they spoke of Jesus, the his here is Jesus' departure. Guess what the word departure is translated elsewhere in the Bible? Exodus. Exodus. Now, who led the exodus of Israel out of slavery? Moses did. Who prophesied about Jesus leading this, being the second Moses, leading a greater exodus? Elijah did. And now they're talking about, hey, Jesus, here just in about six weeks, you're going to make an exodus. You're going to exit this life on the cross, and then you're going to exit the tomb with the resurrection. And Jesus, when Moses led people on an exodus out of slavery and economic bondage into physical freedom, 
Jesus leads an exodus out of freedom from sin and the bondage to sin. A greater exodus. And this is what they're talking about. Jesus is telling them, hey, yeah, in a few days, I've been telling the disciples that the Son of Man must be tortured and rejected by the scribes, the chief priests, and the Pharisees, and killed, and on the third day raised again. I've been telling these guys this. And Moses and Elijah are like, oh, they're getting it. And Jesus is like, no, they're probably not getting it. You know? And they're probably having this discussion right there. And then, and these are all the things which Jesus was about to accomplish. They're talking about it because this is what is about to be done. And Jesus wasn't a victim. Okay? It wasn't like, and the liberal teachers and preachers will say, Jesus was a good teacher and people didn't like him, so they killed him. No, no. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I what? I freely lay it down. Jesus is the one who prophesied his death, his burial and resurrection. This was all orchestrated. Every swing of the nail, everything Pilate said, everything Herod did was orchestrated by God. And they thought they were the ones in control. And Jesus is like, no, I'm in control. I'm totally in control of the situation because this was an accomplishment. To Jesus, this was what he came to do. In Luke 19, 10, he says, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost and to lay down his life a a ransom for many. So this is mission accomplished. That's why he calls it an accomplishment. So now the question is, why, of all the heroes of the Old Testament, why these two? Why Moses? Why Elijah? Well, let me give you several things, and I could literally give you a hundred. I could spend, I could, I could do a ten-week series on Moses and Elijah, but we're going to focus here. For, first of all, these were two great miracle workers, and I didn't say two of the greatest miracle workers. Moses would definitely be at the top of the list of miracle workers of the Old Testament. I mean, look at this scale. He did them on a national level. They weren't just small miracles. They were affecting the greatest empire on earth, and he was crushing them. Through God's power, of course. And I would put Elijah right up there with him. But if you remember, whose predecessor was Elijah? Elisha. Okay? J and S-H. And because God gave Elisha a double portion of the Holy Spirit, it said that he did more miracles than his mentor. So I can't put Elijah up there as the greatest two because Elisha, it'd probably be Moses and Elisha. But Elijah's prophecies about Christ were more specific. That's why he's in this picture right here. Also, there's only three people mentioned in the Bible who fasted 40 days. Guess who? Moses, Elijah, and of course, Jesus. So here's the three guys, and maybe other people did too, but here's the three guys who went through this trial of fasting 40 days, having this conversation. And so that's important that they have that in common. And both Moses and Elijah miraculously provided bread for people just like Jesus did. How did Moses do it? Manna, right? And of course, he's just an instrument. God mostly did it, but he's just the one speaking and telling people what to happen. And then Elijah also multiplied bread for soldiers. There was enough bread, you know, 20 loaves of bread, but he fed 100 soldiers with it. And he also multiplied bread. And Jesus did it, of course, with the, not just once, but twice, right? The feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. Moses and Elijah both had this in common. They both departed this life in a miraculous way. When God told Moses, you're going to die, but first I want you to preach a several-day sermon, you know, Deuteronomy to these people, and then I want you to climb up the mountain, and you're going to die. And who buried Moses? God did. So that was miraculous that his burial, and maybe God put his hands on his face and just put him to sleep. We don't know how it went down. Okay, I don't want to read too much into it, but we know that God miraculously intervened and by himself buried Moses. And then how did Elijah, how did he depart this world? A world, a chariot of fire, right? And caught up in a whirlwind. And so that's it. that brings up a whole other interesting topic there. It, Hebrews says it's appointed unto man once to die. Well, Elijah didn't keep that appointment. And that's why many people think that when, when Christ returns, and the tribulation happens, the Bible says God's going to send two major prophets. And, and we believe it. Some people say Moses and Elijah. Well, Moses died. Elijah didn't. Guess who else didn't die? Enoch. Enoch walked with God, and all of a sudden he wasn't. God just took him to heaven. So my opinion, just my theory here, that the two major prophets in the tribulation that will go around the world preaching the gospel to those who are left behind that it'll be Elijah and Enoch because those two guys have not had their appointment with death. And guess what happens to the two prophets? They get killed. They get martyred for preaching the gospel. And then after four days, 
They stand up and rise from the dead. So they've kept that appointment. That's a, a whole other discussion. But that's why Moses and Elijah here. Um, so Moses represents the law, right? He's the giver of the law. So when people say you need to obey Moses, they meant obey the law. The law and Moses were synonymous, okay? And um, the prophets, Elijah was the representative of all the prophets of the Old Testament. So the first five books, the Pentateuch, were written by who? Moses. The other 34 were written by prophets, okay? And Elijah is the leader of those, historically speaking. They didn't all live at the same time. But when you referred to Moses and the prophets, you were talking about the whole Old Testament. And Jesus, when he was on the road to Emmaus, was talk, after his resurrection, he's talking to these two guys. They don't even realize it's him. And it says he began with Moses and the prophets, showing how it was all about him. We, we believe in something called biblical theology. There's systematic theology, which is good. There's also biblical theology, and that is this, that the whole Bible is about Jesus. Every book of the Bible is about Jesus. It points to him in figures and types, and sometimes just outright, outright says the Messiah or the anointed one or the king to come. But everything is about Jesus. And that's why he, he, so basically Jesus is meeting with the two leaders of the Old Testament who is basically pointing to him, and that's why the transfiguration includes them. Jesus fulfills, so Jesus fulfills the law. You see, how many of you have kept the Ten Commandments? Raise your hand. And if you do raise your hand, you're breaking commandment number four about lying, okay? So none of us have kept the Ten Commandments. Did you know the Ten Commandments are not, their primary purpose is not to be a standard to live by. They're a standard to show us that we're all failures. That none of us can keep the Ten Commandments. But guess who did? Jesus did. You see, not only was he the perfect sacrifice on the cross, he was qualified to be the perfect sacrifice on the cross because prior to that, he lived the perfect life. Perfect life. And I'm talking about from birth to, to crucifixion. Okay? Some people teach, like New Agers teach, that when Jesus became 30, the Holy Spirit came upon him, and that's when he became the Messiah. No, no, no. The angel said, nah. -uh. He said, born unto you this day is a Savior. He was born the Savior. He didn't become the Savior later. He was born the Savior. Now, th this is just an interesting trivia here. Does that mean Jesus didn't make mistakes? It's a good discussion. I think he could probably made mistakes. Because what does Luke tell us about the child Jesus? It says he learned and he grew in wisdom and in stature. So Jesus probably got a, an answer wrong on a math test. It's possible. If, you got a, if, you, if your kid gets an answer wrong on a math test, is that a sin? No. So Jesus was sinless. Okay. But anyway, it's a whole other discussion. Not necessarily important. If you want to believe Jesus never had a bad diaper and Jesus never got a math problem wrong, you, that's great. That's fine. Um, but anyway, Jesus fulfills the law. But again, he also fulfills the prophets. Think about this. If you're a skeptic about the Bible, maybe you're not really sure whether you believe the Bible. That's great. We're glad that you're here this morning. And we welcome that kind of thing. We're, we're open to, we believe our faith can withstand all the hardest questions. And we, we don't, people say, well, I believe in science. We believe in science and the Bible. We think they match together really well because God created science. But did you know that there's over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament? Most of them, at a minimum, 180 years, all the way up to like, 700 years before the life of Jesus that predicted his first coming, just his first coming, where he'd be born, how he would be born, who his parents would be, his genealogy, everything about his life was prophesied. And guess how many came true? How about, how about 100%, okay? So Jesus not only fulfills the law with the perfect life, Moses, but he fulfills the prophecies in 100% Elijah. So that's another reason why we have Moses and Elijah here. So there's a major statement being made here. And also, Jesus is the greater Moses. Again, he leads a bigger exodus, and he's a savior in a better way. Moses lifts up the serpent in the wilderness to heal people from their snake bites. And Jesus says, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So he's excelling past Moses in every way. And Moses was, he was it. He, to all, you, you always, when the scribes and the Pharisees are arguing with Jesus, who are they always quoting? Well, Moses says this. You're not better than Moses. Moses does this. And Jesus you know, says, hey, I'm, I'm better than Moses. And Jesus is the great prophet, okay? These guys in the Old Testament, they made amazing prophecies through the power of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus prophesied amazing things, not only about his death, burial, and resurrection, but about the end of the world. Read Matthew 24 and the chapters to follow. So Jesus is the great prophet. Um, so 
Why Moses and Elijah? The most important reason is to show us who Jesus is. You see, he's not just one amongst these three. He, they're, all, they're pointing to him. Um, Pete, now, Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, man, it's good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Now, some people say, you know, hey, let's hang out for a while. I'm going to throw up a tent, real, you know, pup tent real quick. That's not what he's talking about. If he was going to make a tent just so they could have a sleepover, you wouldn't make three, okay? I have a group of men traveling together can make one big tent, and I'll share that, okay? But he's going to make individual ones because the word tent is the same thing as tabernacle. These are tabernacles to worship Moses, yes, to worship Jesus, yes, to worship Elijah. We're going to worship all three because you guys are amazing. We're going to set up a, a place of worship. And Peter, again, he's missing it. Peter's like many of us. Either he nails it perfectly or he totally blows it and puts his foot in the mouth once again. Um, so to treat Jesus like he is one great religious leader among many, it's an insult. So when college professors or politicians say Jesus was a great leader and there's many roads up the mountain and Buddha and Allah and Hinduism and Shintoism and all those things, they're all paths that lead to the same place. Jesus is one amongst many leaders. It's an insult. It'd be like me saying, yeah, Tammy is one of many women I've loved throughout my lifetime. And yes, she's a very special lady like many other special ladies in the world. Man, she would be furious, right? Either she's the one or she's none, right? You can't present it that way, and you can't do that to Jesus. In fact, Islam, most Muslims who believe the Quran, if you say Islam is like all the other religious world, that's fighting words, okay? And Buddha, same thing. He, made, he left no room for any other world religions because Buddha didn't believe in a God. He didn't claim to be God. He just said, this is the way the universe works, and if you're smart, you'll do this. And he said some smart things, but he never claimed to be God. Some parts of Buddhism have elevated him to God. But he never would have said, he would have said all these other ones are wrong. It's a fantasy, you know, to believe in God and angels and stuff like that. No, no, no. This is the way the world is. And you die and you become part of the universe and all that stuff. Hinduism makes no room for other religions. They have tens of thousands of gods and none of them are Jesus. Okay? So it's an insult. To, you know, the only people... The only people in the world who pretty much say all paths lead to God and all religions are the same are educated white Americans. The rest of the world does not think that way. We are an incredibly small minority who think that way. Pretty much people on NBC, MSNBC, CBS, that's correct for them to say. But in the rest of the world, that's a joke. That, that's just not even, that's not even plausible to say that. It, it, it's, as, it's as ridiculous as saying you can believe 2 plus 2 is 7, and you can believe 2 plus 2 is 5, and you can believe 2 plus 2 is 37 and a half. You know, it, it's fine. It's all great. It, it's, it's not. It's ridiculous. And it's, the main thing is it's an insult to Christ to put him on that level. And that's basically what Peter's doing. Tabernacle for you, tabernacle for Elijah, tabernacle for Moses. Great. He's putting them all on the same level. And it, it, it says here, Peter's basically nervous talking. This is, he didn't know what to say because so, he's scared to death. So, uh, let's build some tabernacles. You know, he's just panicking. You ever do that? You get terrified and you just say stupid things? I'm not the only one, right? Am I? Okay. We all do this, right? Verse 7 says, And then a cloud overshadowed him. And this is a hyperlink back to the Old Testament. When the cloud appeared on the mountain with Moses, when the cloud appeared on the tabernacle, when the cloud filled the glory of the temple, all these, this is a hyperlink to all of those, it overshadowed them. So all of a sudden they're seeing on this mountain, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, and Jesus is glowing. And all of a sudden there's a cloud and they can't see anything and they're covered. And this cloud is glowing too. And a voice came out of the cloud. Also a hyperlink because what happened at the Ten Commandments? A voice came out of the cloud. He said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. So in Exodus 33, when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of the cloud would descend. This is, it would descend. Like, and this is what on, was an ongoing thing that happened multiple times. And stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak to Moses. So you see what's happening here? This is a, this is a hyperlink back to this story in the Old Testament. We also see this. Deuteronomy 5.22. These words the Lord spoke to all the assembly at the mountain, right? Where's the transfiguration happening? On a mountain. And out of the midst of the fire and the cloud and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he began added no more, and he wrote them 
on two tables of stone and gave them to him. So even the Ten Commandments, the tabernacle, all these things. In Exodus 19, now watch this distinction. So you shall set limits. In other words, they set up like rails, like crowd control rails or whatever, uh, all around the mountain and said, take care, you be careful not to go up into the mountain or even touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. Okay? You saw in the Old Testament, now follow me here, track me with me here. The Old Testament, when the, when the glory of God descended, it was a scary thing. Okay? Remember, uh, the glory of God was in the um, Ark of the Covenant. And remember, they were returning to Ark of the Covenant after recovering from the Philistines, but they were doing it wrong. And it's, they had it on an ox cart, and it started to fall off. And one of the guys caught it, and when he touched it, what happened to him? Yeah, you didn't mess with the glory of God. How many of you remember uh, Indiana Jones and the Raider of the Ar Lost Ark? Remember that story? How many old enough to remember that? Go back and watch that, okay? And YouTube, good movie for you young guys. Um, but the, the, the Nazis through archaeology, discovered the Ark of the Covenant. They thought, well, if this is, can destroy armies in the Bible, we can use it today to win World War II. And, of course, they open it. What happens? Their, their faces melt, you know, and it's just crazy because of, because of the glory of God. Very biblical movie, by the way. Okay. Okay, well, at least that part. Okay. Uh, so, and can you go to the next slide for me? Looks mine's frozen here. So, what this is showing in the Old Testament is there is an incredible gap between a holy God and sinful humans. And that gap is infinite. It is so wide. And that's what the holiness of God and the power of God are trying to show. God is incredibly holy. We are incredibly sinful. Okay? God is incredibly powerful. We are totally weak and helpless. And that God is so powerful and so holy that he is untouchable. In the Old Testament, God is untouchable, okay? But Jesus bridges that gap. Let me see if I can get this to work. All right, go to the next slide for me there. So Jesus bridges the gap as he becomes touchable. See, the God of the Old Testament, untouchable. The glory of God was something to be scared of. It came down with a cloud, lightning, and flashing, and you stayed away. You dare not come near the mountain or you'll die. But Jesus, become, that God of the Old Testament, becomes human flesh and becomes touchable. And Joseph gets to touch him first as Mary gives birth to him. And, gives him, and so Joseph and Mary touch the living God who became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's the purpose of the transfiguration is that the God who is so distant because of our sin, Jesus comes flesh and be, bridges that gap so that God can be touchable. Next slide. So who is Jesus? This reveals that he's not just another prophet like Moses and Elijah. He's much bigger and better than them. And, and what has he done? He's made God no longer something scary, but someone touchable, someone who came... Because we were not strong enough to go up the mountain, so God came down the mountain to, to be with us and to become flesh and to be born amongst us. And go to the next slide for me. So now the third point quickly here. How can we connect to him? How can you touch this God who has become touchable? Keep going. So now back to 2 Peter. Remember, Peter's one of the three who's witnessing this whole thing, and, uh, and he's writing about it. He says, when we received honor and glory from the Father and the voice that was born, the majestic, the kingdom in power voice of glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Go ahead again to the next slide. We ourselves heard this very voice born, born from heaven, for we were with him where? On the holy mountain. So it's not the baptism, right? And it's not the other time. The, only, the three times that God spoke, the, on the, and it was on the holy mountain, was the transfiguration. And that's why I believe that that he, when he talks about some of you will see the kingdom of God it, it, shortly thereafter that. Thank you. All right. Some of you will see this, and I believe that's what they saw on the holy mountain. So you, you might be saying, man, I wish I could be Peter, and I, if I had just seen the transfiguration, man, I would be so much stronger in my faith if I could just see something like that. You know, you know have you ever wondered that? Have you ever thought that way? And, and maybe you know someone who's kind of, exploring Christianity, not sure if they want to become a Christian or not. And they're like, you know, if God could just show me a miracle. And then they say, if I would believe. And in fact, there's some churches that, and I believe in miracles, okay? But there's some churches all about miracles, 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 just experience. And, and miracles can be good. But if we put all of our hope and faith in seeing a miracle, Jesus says, 
It's a wicked generation that seeks always a sign, always looking for a miracle. That's why he chased the crowd away, and he put his focus on the teaching. He said, and, and you may be that way here this morning, but listen to what Peter says. Peter, now keep in mind, he saw Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. He saw Jesus glowing. He saw his clothes radiant and sparkling. But listen to what he says. Even after he talks about this majestic appearing, he says, and we have the prophetic word. More, more fully confirmed. If the transfiguration confirmed who Jesus was, my Bible confirms it even more. Do you understand what's being said right there? You get to behold the transfiguration of Christ when you open the Word of God. It is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. You want to see something miraculous? Get into the Bible. And even better yet, let the Bible get into you. Peter says, that experience I had, I've got something even more. In fact, the King James says, I'm a more sure word of prophecy. I've got something even more dependable than what I remember. Because here's what happens. How many of you remember things differently? You know, you tell a story, like when you get a family reunion, you get together, you say, hey, remember that time Uncle so-and-so did this, and I was there? And well, you weren't there. And like, you've heard the story so many times, you kind of inject yourself in it. I have a relative who, when they tell the stories, all these stories about our grandma, Every single story is about them and grandma. And I'm like, it wasn't you. That was my sister. You know, you're telling the story wrong. But we, ins- and really, have you ever had someone tell you some instructions? And then a couple days later, what did they say? It was this, this. You know, your memory can fail you, but the word of God never will. You forget what the Bible says, go back and read it. And so every time Peter's like, man, that transfiguration thing, was that a dream? Did we really do it? And maybe he talks to James and John, and maybe they might remember it differently, but they can't change the Bible. It is what it is, and they see that in that situation. He says, it's more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. What did David say about your word as a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? The Bible is amazingly powerful. Let me just challenge this. If you're not sure about being a Christian, I want you to get a Bible. We'll give you one if you want. Go to the Gospel of John and just read it. Just read it, and it'll be different than anything you've ever read. Because you're not just reading about someone, but the very person who inspired this book will be right there with you, helping you to understand it. And and the Word of God is powerful in that way. And so Moses, remember what happened to Moses? When he asked to see God's glory, and and God passed by, and God says, I'm not going to let you see my whole glory because you'll die, but I'll let you see the, the trail of what I leave behind in my glory. And what happened to Moses' face because of that? He was glowing. So he comes down and people are like, whoa, Moses, turn it off, turn it off. He's like, I can't turn it off, you know. And, it, and Moses wasn't glowing from within, okay. Remember the old glow-in-the-dark toys? What did you have to do with them for the first 24 hours? You put them under a lamp and they absorb the light. And then when you turn off the lights, they're glowing, but they're only glowing because they absorb something outside of them. So Moses wasn't glowing from within. He's, well, he was like that little neon green thing glowing in the dark because he absorbed the glory of God. And so what did he do? He put a veil over his face. And then Paul, in in the most beautiful way, uses this veil as an illustration. In 2 Corinthians, he says, yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, how do you read a person? No, no, what does Moses represent? The law, the first five books. Whenever we read the first five books, when we read it, it, there's a veil that lies over their hearts. He's talking about Israel. Why? You know, Jesus was Jewish. He came to the Jews, and most Jews to this day have rejected him. Why? This verse explains it. There's a veil. Just like there was a veil over Moses' face blocking the light, there's a veil over Jewish people's hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And he goes on to say, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, we don't have to put a veil on when we read the Bible. We don't have to worry about it glowing and destroying us and all that stuff. He said, we're beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed. Let's just stop there for a second. Are you tired of being the way you are? There, there's so many times a week I'm like, Gary, you're so stupid. I'm like, how old are you and you're still doing the same dumb stuff? You know, we're like Paul, the good I want to do, I don't do it. And then the bad I tell myself I'm not going to do, I I do. And I'm like, how many times do I have to learn this lesson? You want to be transformed? You want a metamorphosis to happen to you? Read the word. 
Read the Word. Don't keep looking for a miracle. If God gives you a miracle, great. But you get into the Bible. Go to church, great. But get into the Word on your own, too. Go to life group, awesome. But get into the Word on your own daily as well. He says the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. Same as who? Same as Jesus. We're to being conformed to the image of Jesus. From one degree of glory to another. How does it happen? How do you become a better Christian? How do you become a stronger Christian? One degree at a time. One degree. A baby step every day. A little more like Jesus. And sometimes you'll take two steps back. But then you keep taking a little baby step forward. Baby step forward. One degree at a time. And you all do it by looking in the Word. Now, back to our passage here. Mark 9. And then suddenly look around. The cloud's gone. And they no longer saw anyone. No more Moses. No more Elijah. But read the last part with me. But Jesus only. And all three Gospels that record a story word it the exact same way. But Jesus only. That's really important. Because that's what it's all about. Salvation is through Jesus only. It's not, you have, well, you have your religion, I have mine. It's Jesus only. And it's not Jesus plus your baptism. That baptism is a good thing. It's not Jesus and speaking in tongues. These are all maybe good things. It's not Jesus and you promise to live a good life. It's not Jesus and, and you avoid all these sins. There's a denomination that has identified 16 sins. If you do one of these 16, you lose your salvation. I'm like, what Bible are you reading? <laughs> you know, if salvation is a gift, you guess what? You can't earn it. And if you're not good enough to get it, how are you going to be good enough to keep it? I am saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. It's Jesus only. Listen, don't take my word for it. Acts chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, he's preaching to the Jews, whom God raised from the dead, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Being saved is not optional, by the way. It says must. Saved save from what? All of us are under a judgment. The judge has spoken. The gavel has come down. We are all condemned to die because the wages, what you earn for your sin is death. And every spotty in this room has sinned, including me. We have all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no one that can go up the mountain. But thank the Lord, the God of the mountain came down to us to reach us and to be with us. You see, people always try to mix up the gospel. They try to nullify it. In fact, the Galatians were believing in Christ, and all of a sudden they started listening to these teachers saying, well, yes, you have to get saved, but then you have to get circumcised. And they were adding one little work to it. And, P and Paul says, if you add even one little work, you've nullified it. He said, I'm not going to nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If you could be saved by being a good person, be saved by being circumcised, be saved by being baptized, or any of those things, then what did Jesus die for? When Jesus had his nails and his hands spread out, what did he say on the cross? It is finished. Everything that could be done, everything that needed to be done to save your soul was done there. There's nothing you can add to it. So if I, I said, hey, I want to give you, uh, Jaime, here, here, I want to give you this iPad. And it's just, a, it's a gift. What do you have to do to make this gift yours, Jaime? What do you have to do? Just take it. Just take it. If Jaime pulls into his pocket and pulls out $1 and gives it to me, because that's all he has, which we know he has a lot more than that, right? Okay. Anyway, if he pulls out $1 and gives that to me, that's a great deal. But is this a gift? It's a purchase. If I said, hey, Jaime, thank you for mowing my lawn the other day when my back was out. I appreciate it. Here, I appreciate you. Here, I want you to have this. Is this a gift or is it payment? Sounds like payment because of what he did. Or if I say, Jaime, here, I want you to have this iPad, but you better be here next Sunday, and the Sunday after that, and the Sunday after that, and when it's your time to clean the church, you better show up because as soon as you miss one of those, I'm taking this back. Is that a gift? It's an obligation. Salvation is not to be purchased. It's not a payment for what you've done. It's not an obligation you have to keep. It's a gift you received. Now, he could use this iPad to do stupid things with it, but it's still his. But if he's truly thankful for the gift, guess what he'll do? He'll use it in a way that would please the gift giver. You see, if any true born-again Christian lives right for the Lord, 
They're not doing it to keep their salvation, to earn their salvation. They're doing it because I am thankful that Jesus did all that for me. That's what salvation means. So when the Bible, well, the reason they, everybody else disappeared, because it's no longer about Moses and keeping the law. It's no longer about these prophecies. It's about Jesus only. He's the one who saves. So as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them something really weird. He says, tell no one. This is the pattern we see in Mark, right? Hey, I healed a blind man. No, don't tell anybody. What? I, heard, I healed a guy who couldn't speak, and now he can speak, and, but don't tell anybody. What, the greatest thing I'm supposed to talk about I can't talk about? Of course, Jesus is delaying it for a reason, because later he tells, says, tell everybody, because he wants the whole package. He doesn't want it just to be about the incarnation. He doesn't want it just to be about the feeding the 5,000 and the blind. He doesn't want it just to be about the transfiguration. He wants it to be, include the death, burial, and resurrection, because you've got to get that, that because that's what the rest of the story leads up to. It'd be like reading a book and then putting it down in the last chapter and not knowing who killed, who was the murderer. You know, it doesn't, you don't have the whole picture there. You're just telling part of the story. And then he says, but until I've risen from the dead, now I want you to go tell everybody. So they kept this matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead means. They still don't get it. They're like, so is this another parable? Are we supposed to say he's like literally rising from the dead? Or is this just another one of those stories Man, we are confused. That, 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 what does this all mean? And they asked him, why do, you, why do the scribes and the Pharisees, well, I'm sorry, Freudian slip, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? Because that's what the whole problem with Jesus was. Elijah hadn't come already. And they're like, you can't be the Messiah because Elijah hasn't come first. And he said to them, Elijah does come. He first to restore all things. But what you're confusing here is the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. The Old Testament talks about two comings of the Messiah, but they were totally fixated on one, because that's the one where you destroy the world, you know, and, and set up the kingdom. But the, they were missing the Messiah who comes to die for the sins of the world. He says, and he asked them a question. You know, you guys want to talk about what's supposed to come first. How is it written that the Son of Man should, must suffer many things? You're focused on this one, but you need to be focused on me suffering. I've been trying to tell you that. And, and I, not only will I suffer, I'm going to be treated badly with contempt. And he says, but I tell you, Elijah has come. And they did him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. And what he's referring to is Luke spells out a little more. And he, talking about John the Baptist, will go before him in the spirit and the power of who? Elijah. The fulfillment of Elijah was in John the Baptist. There's a literal fulfillment of Elijah in the second coming, right? Okay, but this is the figurative one, so it's a dual fulfillment. Okay, and Matthew 11 says, For all the law and the prophets prophesied until John, John the Baptist, and if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah to come. In other words, he's coming in the way that was prophesied in the spirit of Elijah, and then the literal will come later at the second coming. Spirit of Elijah, first coming, physical Elijah in the second coming. So he makes it very, very clear. So the transfiguration shows who Jesus is, what he has done, and how we can connect to him. Later, Jesus would go up on another holy mountain, and this time it's not with his disciples. Instead of being celebrated amongst these two heroes, Moses and Elijah, he's crucified between two thieves. And this time, instead of glowing in his glorious white robes, he's naked and covered with his own blood. Instead of being in a cloud of light covering him, he hangs in darkness in the middle of the day. And instead of hearing from his father, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. All he hears is silence and rejection as he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See what the transfiguration is all about? Jesus sat, died in silence so that you could live and hear the voice of your father saying, You're my beloved son as well in whom I am well pleased. Jesus was rejected so that you could be accepted. Jesus died so that you could live. The transfiguration was so that we could know who Jesus was, but more importantly, the crucifixion was so we could know how much he loves us. The transfiguration is amazing. Titus chapter 3 says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior, if you're wondering if Jesus is God, there it is, God our Savior appeared, okay, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. It's not how good you are, you keep the Ten Commandments, you got baptized, or any of those things. But according to his own mercy. What is mercy? When God gives you something you do not deserve, 
and by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Have you received the mercy of Christ? Have you been washed? Have you been made new? I would like for you to just bow your heads and close your eyes, everybody, if you don't mind, just so we can focus on what we've, been, we've heard from the Lord here this morning. And if you know for sure that you've been born again, you've been washed, you've been renewed, and that you're saved, then please pray that God opens hearts and minds here this morning. But if you're not sure, let the skepticism end today. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. God appeared as your Savior on the cross. He proved who he was at the transfiguration. He proved how much he loved you on the cross. Those nails should have been Gary's. That crown of thorns should have been ours. The beating he took upon his back was because of our sin. All of them. He took upon your sin and mine on that cross. He took your punishment. But even better, three days later, just like he predicted, he rose again with life and eternity for all who believe. And all he asks is you receive this gift. You trust him. Stop trusting in your own good behavior. Stop trusting in how smart you may think that you are. All the good things you've done at the homeless shelter and everywhere else, forget all that. Those are good, but none of them, none of them will save you. Only the work that Christ did on the cross can save you. You could trust him right now and maybe pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I do believe you died for me, for all the horrible things I've done. I believe that every failure you took upon the cross. I put my faith in you this morning. I make you the Lord of my life. You gave your life for me, so I give my life to you. Be the Lord of my life and the master of my soul and the Savior that I need. And I ask this in your name. Amen. If you, if you made that decision, I mean, I'd love to hear from you about that. I'd like to talk to you about your next steps as a new believer. This is my cell phone right there, so you can text me anytime. And uh, speaking of my cell phone, if you have a question, you can text that in right now. Um, at, uh, well, Tori, Tori, come on up here. I didn't see Tori a minute ago, so I was going to go to plan C. All right, here we go. Um, so text those questions in. And, uh, or if, if you uh, would rather just raise your hand, you can do that as well. Okay, there we go. There's the first one. Do we know of any missionaries in or around Ukraine that we can pray for or support financially as they minister to the refugees and those hurting in the country? Ma'am, great question. Um, I'm going to have to forward you an email that names some of them. I don't recall any of them right now. I don't even know if I could pronounce them. <laughs> A lot of them are, are native missionaries with Ukrainian names as well. But... Um, yeah, that's a great question. So if you'll text me your email address, and that goes for anybody, I could forward you that, those names, but none of them are coming to mind right now. I don't know any of them personally, just through, through our network. All right? In the parable of the sow, sour, Jesus, sour. Okay, sour yeah. Jesus explains to the disciples that the ones on the rocky soil are the ones who, when they hear the word, re receive it with joy but these have no root. They believe for a while, and in, a, and in a time of testing, fall away. Does this indicate that salvation can be lost? Yeah, great question. I just actually taught on this passage. My mic's going? I just taught on this passage a few weeks ago, when we were, or months ago, actually, when we were in this in Mark. So the, the, the distinguisher between those who are saved and not saved in that passage is... Um, whether they bear fruit or not. And so the, the seed that bears fruit are the ones who are truly saved. So the ones who appear to be saved, but they get excited, but there's, it says there's no root. Okay, so the seed is not the root. And of course, the soil is a picture of the heart. And so therefore, if they're not taking root, then the gospel has not traveled the 18 inches from their head to their heart. Okay? Um, my phone's on. Okay. Um, I do have it on. So, um, and we all know people who got saved, got excited, but as soon as hard times come, they're out the door, they're gone. And that's evidence not that they lost their salvation, but they never were truly saved, in my opinion. Now, are there Christians who do believe you can lose your salvation? Yes, there are people who believe that, and I'm not saying they're not saved, they're, they're heretics, good Christians disagree on this. But I do believe um, that salvation is of the Lord, 
So therefore, it's the Lord that's going to do it. But um, Paul said to Timothy, I know whom I have believed, and I'm, I'm persuaded that he is able. Okay. <laughs> all right. So... The, the, in all the parable the sower is told multiple times, and the distinguisher is, does it bear fruit or not? And Jesus said, by their fruit you will know them. Not their roots, not that it looked like it was doing something, but is there fruit? That's the difference. And if there's not fruit in your life, you have good reason to believe maybe you're not saved. Yeah. In the Old Testament, no human could look upon the glory of God without dying. When Jesus was transfigured, Peter, James, and John saw Jesus and yet were safe. Was Jesus transfigured with the full glory of God, or was that glory still being veiled by the human flesh of Jesus? So that's, that's a good question, and theologians disagree. Some people say, yes, they saw the full glory of God, but because the way Jesus did it, he made God touchable, so now... What used to kill you now will save you. And then others say, there's a passage that talks about being veiled in flesh, and that that veil is what prevented you from seeing the full glory of God and living. Again, I, I don't know if I have a great answer for you, um, but that, that, that's the two theories on it. One more question. So Adam and Eve were never babies. That's correct. That's correct. Everything in creation was made complete. Every tree was made bearing fruit, fruit already. Uh, in fact... One of the things that evolutionists say skeptically is if, the, if, the, um, if, if creation is true and the earth is only eight, seven to 10,000 years old, then how can light from a star that's a million miles away and it takes you know, 10, 000, you know, 30,000 years to get here, how could it have God created the light intact? The light beam was already intact. Everything was already there. You don't have to wait for it to travel. So that's consistent with everything Jesus made in creation, he made everything mature. And so w there's your answer to what came first, the chicken or the egg. It was the chicken, right? It came ready to, bear, to have eggs, but it was, it was the chicken first. All right. 